Here we are, episode three, Cup of Chi, with, that rhymes, Jonathan Shubbs. <laughs> Jonathan Shubbs is the author of Sons, Season of Channels, brand new perspective based on ancient medicine, uh, introducing you to Chinese medicine, the concepts and the theories of the channels and the differentiation of the channels and what it means. Great thing about this book is it's for lay people, not just for academics. And it's been great because I can literally walk around with it stuffed in my pocket. I'm not carrying a big, massive, you know, we, we've had to suffer the years, Jonathan, having me these massive books that are like, you know, 400 mm -hmm. euros and you have to, you can weight lift with them. But like, that's the essence in there. Once you get, once you get that essence, then it makes everything else. It's the, it's the key to the lock, right? That's how I, that's how I see it. Um, Jonathan has been practicing Chinese medicine for many, many years, has trained in lots of different systems. I'm sure he's going to talk about it today. We've, if you look back on my uh, channel, we've had lots of conversations about all kinds of things from dragons to philosophy to, I don't know, weird stuff, um, woo woo. So Jonathan, say hello to the folks and let and, and let's talk about your new new adventure. This is very exciting yes. for you. Great. So yeah, thanks for having me, Anthony. And yeah, so that book is coming out in ten days on the twenty first of July. Um, and it's exactly what you said. It's about trying to find a way to simplify and condense, but in a very accessible way the basic theories and concepts and ideas and philosophy of channel system and Chinese medicine. Very good. Um, I'm on a call. Say hello to my daughter. Say hello to Jonathan. Yeah. We're actually recording a podcast, but you can congratulate him on his new book. Hi, Abby. Thank you. Blood on the leg from the cat. Right. Uh, Could you give us a few more minutes, please? Because we need to record and this is, yes. Okay, we'll go and sort it out for me. And the pancakes there for you. Okay. <laughs> pancakes always work for kids. So we might have to edit that bit. So we were saying basically that... Um, so yeah, this is the key that that, that, that um, opens the door. Um, I'd say it was a bit a bit of a a challenge to make it condense condense it because I know you like detail. You're a Virgo, I right? De devil in the detail. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that's also one of the reasons why I wrote it as a story, um, which is different than all of the other, well, the majority of other Chinese books. Hmm. As a story, it's between a grandchild and their grandparents. So it allows a, a conversation to happen. And through conversation, we can explain things differently than having to give thousands and thousands of examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what I liked was the relationship, you know, um, between, you know, the grandmother and all that sort of stuff. That to me was, you know, there's this essence of nourishing. You've got like the male male part of the the direction and then the elderly female is nourishing it and and then obviously the inquis the, the like you just saw there a classic example of a child like inquisitiveness like what's going on even though i told her maybe two hours ago not to come in they still come in it's like don't think of a blue tree they're gonna think of a blue tree it's just like exactly so um that's what i liked about it is the the you know there was this kind of I wouldn't say pushiness, but this inqu inquisitivity, you know, and um, I feel sorry for that kid. Actually, it's pro the kid's probably now completely overwhelmed with with information. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because I'm in the process of writing the second book in the series, which is yeah. a more adapt a more advanced version of the same story, where yeah. we go into actually how to use the information. Yeah, awesome. What what do you think the purpose of the book is? Because I know you've trained at multiple systems and trained with a few famous acupuncturists, but what, 
what was the purpose for you? Was it to kind of write it as how you would have liked to have learnt it as a student, or was it just were you well, wrestling with ideas and thought, no, I, I can I can present this in a in the a book hand. actually has its roots in me. I had to teach um, a group of massage therapists the channel system in a day. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, that was the challenge that was given to me by a school. And so I had to figure out how to make it into a story and to simplify it. And so from that experience, I started realizing that there's many ways that we can understand it. And if we break it down into these logical steps, yeah, from yin-yang to five elements, etc., we don't have to memorize anything. We can do it through understanding. And that was the... Then I started also teaching um, continuing education programs because I, I have my own system of acupuncture, unified acupuncture theory. And when I was giving those courses, I also noticed that a lot of people didn't have access to a lot of the basics. These are trained acupuncturists, but acupuncture school, they, they saw this in the first year and then they forgot about it because it didn't talk to them. Yeah. So that was the reason um, behind writing this book was to give a simplified, not simple, but a simplified meaning that it's down to its bare bones of logic of how we can understand yin yang theory, five element theory and channel theory and how they all come together and how it's not about, um, like I'm sure when you were studying acupuncture, they would say, this is the lung channel and you had to memorize its trajectory. And that was the end of the story. Yeah. Well, I, you know, interestingly for me, I, I, <laughs> I, I, before I even got to that stage, I got sort of curveball thrown at me by, by an older gentleman, an older Chinese gentleman who didn't conform to the, the set, uh, you know, long, you know, following that cycle, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. and then, but I, I marched on anyway into the TCM kind of semi scoff, semi scoffing what he was saying. And then, and then facing this dichotomy of this kind of opposition between what he was saying and what I was learning. And I was figuring in my head because it was a TCM school, that's what I needed to do to be recognized in, in the field of what I was doing and to be licensed it's only now, and I mean, that was over 20 years ago. It's only now I'm starting to see the transition, you know, away from TCM. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was always there. It was always there, that transition. But it's just, <clears throat> if anything, TCM came in and tried to steal the thunder. And uh, and it and it, it maybe it got away with it for 30, 40 years, but... Um, what kind of annoyed me a little bit was the guys that were doing the classical were a little bit, can be a little bit smug. Uh, mm -hmm. and I don't mean, I'm not necessarily mean the Chinese people, but the people that maybe, uh, received it and, um, then they garnered it for themselves, you know, which is that classical kind of Kung Fu master, like we'll teach you just enough, but not enough to be able to beat me. And, um, so that kind of annoyed me, but so meeting this guy who he passed away in 2015, but he 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 picked up a big book I had on TCM and he just threw it in the fireplace. You know, it's like, I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Ah, oh, very good for warming the feet." You know, <laughs> and, and, and I was like, "What? I've just spent 150 quid on this book and you're throwing it in the fireplace." He said, "That's all it's good for." And that was maybe a bit more of an extreme example. Mm -hmm. What I like about this is, I, I think some of my latest students, the last three or four years, they've been privileged because. They've learned it kind of in reverse. So they've learned more classical stuff first. And then I forced them to go back and learn TCM. And, and none of them, in, you know, none of them enjoyed it. They were like, oh, God, really? Do we really have to do this? You know, um, and I, some, some liked it. Some liked it. Some liked like a systemization kind of thing. They didn't want to do the logic. They just wanted to be told. And I think that's why TCM has has become so popular. It's popular with like doctors and physios because it's like, what point is good for the knee? Mm -hmm. What point is good for nasal obstruction? 
And, and you know, while I have my own theories on local and distal points, and for those of the lay people, what we're talking about here is, is giving you the opportunity to learn about uh, what acupuncture, how it, the journey towards the, the discovery and um, and that not all acupuncture is the same, right? It's not one size fits all. There are, uh, there are, it's, I liken it to a house that's been built by several architects and they all have their own ideas about how the building should look. Um, and then we can go into a massive rant about distal and local points and, you know, well, this book doesn't it doesn't touch on the application, so we're not looking at how to use the points. No. Um, what one of the things that I, another belief that I have, or another idea, is is that as you were saying, within the acupuncture community, there are many different theories, but there are a couple of things that everybody agrees on. For example, the underlying principles of yin and yang. And then the next thing in Chinese philosophy, and this is not just about medicine, but it's also about Western philosophy is understanding the five elements. And the last thing is the placement of the channels, where they are on the body and their names. So what I've done is I've taken those three main concepts and then I got, I tried to work backwards. So instead of using all the explanations that you'll find in TCM books or in the classics, Mm. is to come to an understanding of how these three main theories can be explained. What's the logical steps in them? One of the, you know, um, Chinese medicine, it's been documented for over 2,500 years. And in that 2,500 years, there's been a lot of influences of geopolit geopolitics, economics, pol political structures, um, philosophy, religion, to try to manipulate it, to show it as something else that it isn't. So and when you read some of the classics that explain something, they go into these very elaborate, beautiful explanations. But as soon as you move out of the ge geography of China, for example, and they're associating certain elements with certain parts of the country, that no longer makes sense. So one of the things about this book is, is that it tries to give a universal explanation that is systematic no matter where you are, for the for how Chinese medicine works with the human body, um, so you don't have to read the classics. You don't have to be um, steeped in Chinese mythology to understand how it works. Yeah, I have a couple of clients who've already requested to order the book there from from Single mm -hmm. Dragon. So, you know, that's where Excellent. we're at. That's where we're at with it. It's, it's a book that I can leave in the clinic. It's not just a book for students or it, it's, it's literally, I'm fast, you know, I'm, I've all like some clients have always had a fascination with this and then you show them the books that you were originally given and it's just, it's off putting, you know, it's, it's a thousand pages of graphics and text and actions and, and using terminology that doesn't uh, translate well, I think into English and, mm -hmm. um, then to have something that they know they can they can bring on holiday, they can have it you know on the on the dining room table, they can read on the toilet, whatever it is, it, it's <laughs> it's there you know it's there it's easy to access, and um, I see you got the the illustrator is an Irish chap I believe, it is it's Fergus Bryan he's um I recognise we, we did a lot of work on really how to get the illustrations to uh come to life yeah and yeah. they're all hand drawn they're very just for illustrations it's a beautiful book yeah yeah and um as the book is told as a story all of the illustrations are shown as the grandparents or the grandchild drawing yeah so it's not these schematic images they have a lot of you know it gives the book more 
more energy, more soul, because it feels like it's actually a real conversation with how it would, how a grandparent and grandchildren would be explaining to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love, I think my favorite illustrations are the ones at the back, looking at the channels. Of the channels. Yeah. Yeah. And it's... Um, and- it's and then we did a very specific thing because traditionally they have the channels drawn in these anatomical, either it's on an anatomical body mm. or it's an ancient Chinese man and a woman. And these are real people. You can look at it and you can see yourself, you can see your parents, you can see your children. And it's just showing you where it is. It's very simple in its, you know, and it's a very good reference for anybody, not just acupuncturists. You know, there's more and more people who are starting to use channel theory in their, in their lives. Yoga instructors, shiatsu, teach, shiatsu um, any type of healing technique, all of those things. Yeah, yeah. It's great. I mean, you got a forward there by Simon Becker as well, who's been quite a pivotal person in your in in your links with teaching i believe and and that's great to Mm -hmm. see and dave our old our buddy dave dave ships he's got a mention in there and there's some chap called anthony monteith whoever he is and then yeah yeah and a bit of a gangster i think and then shauna (laughs) shana shobbs who's shana shobbs that's my sister ah so there is a story about this is that I had written a first copy of this, a first version of this book about four years ago. Hmm. And I had not written it as a story. I had written it as almost a technical book. Right. And she's a copywriter, an editor, more academic. But I showed it to her and she said, you don't have a voice. And after talking to her about it, I realized that this is not the way that I wanted to present it. So I scrapped that book and I rewrote it from zero with the story. Hmm. So that's why she's in, um, she was pivotal in changing the way in which I told it, hmm. which I think really makes the book much more accessible and, and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm privileged to have a copy here. You know what I mean? Uh, we've had, we've had a great time over the, the last year, this whole lockdown malarkey and we've been trying to get you over here for like six months and i'm sure it's gonna it's gonna happen um we're just waiting for ireland to get itself you know out of its uh remove the, some of the restrictions we're facing still but mm-hmm. um we get you over here do some teaching get any of the lads that are, um, are interested i know i've got a few other instructors looking to come over so there's definitely that feeling of getting back into movement and one-on-one um I mean, for me, as I said before, the books for graduates, undergraduates, it's all so, it's just the story is so, it's fun, you know, it's just fun. And then, you know, you you can, what I like the way you wrote it was, it's not, um, it doesn't sit into any particular cultural appropriate appropriation. It's not Asian or, you know, it's not, do you know what I'm trying to say? There's, there's, you, mm-hmm. could, you could fit it into any culture, you know, it, it's not, you know, like I'm this book that I'm working on. It's like a Westerner going to Asia, looking for the answers and then only finding him when he comes back home. So um, it's that idea that, you know, uh, removing that mysticism from it, you know, exactly. And then it's like a practical understanding of, where, where people were at the time and um, because we're talking about channels and meridians and that just, you know, for a lot of lay people, that's just like, it's going to go straight yeah. up their head, you know? For sure. And there's also an interesting mechanism in the book where the child is, it has no specific gender. And what's been interesting is, is when I ask people, you know, what do you think of the main character, the child? Some of them say, oh, she's, it's a beautiful little girl, or someone says it's an inquisitive boy. And you can really see that each person is able to create their own image of the child. Yeah. So they're able to put themselves in there and not as be this 
um, prescribed idea of who the person is. They can actually make, one of the ideas is to open up the inquisitive child within each of us. Hmm. What's it, what's it feel like now to be an author, right? I know we're still waiting for the book to be officially released and there's a period of, we talked about it before we went on live trepidation and, and mm -hmm. you know, wondering how it's going to be received, you know, and, um, and we, we know both mutually know at least one or two authors on social media that have either loved or hated. And I think, that's part part of it, isn't it? When you start lighting that flare and you're shooting it up into the sky, you know, you're going to, it's either a distress call or it's a call to action. Um, I mean, my teacher used to say, when you put the lights on, you might attract some moths, you know, so be prepared for that. Um, so is there anything coming out of, I know you're working on the second book already, but is there mm -hmm. any, has this authorship brought brought limelight to the situation already like are you preparing to do talks or events or you know is there a kind of because this usually the book is the is the vehicle really yeah and that is the long-term plan but because of all the constraints of travel etc it's very difficult to make those plans mm, sure Sure. And also it's coming out in the middle of, of July. So there's not going to be a huge amount of, you know, most people on holiday, etc. So we'll, I'll probably start doing more and more talks towards the end of the summer. Um, we're going to have a book launch in Switzerland in October. Nice. Um, and we might also do something online. We're looking to see if we can find a good moment to do something. Um, but those are definitely there uh, in the woodworks. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how to do that because yeah, things like, are more complicated now than they've ever been before to do these sure, types of things. Sure. It seems like each country has its own little rules as well, individual rules around movement and gathering of groups. Yeah. And stuff. Um, so great. And I, I also noticed like over the last year or more that we've been chatting pretty much quite regularly Um Huge interest in trauma work, uh, mm -hmm. interest, you know, your your work in acupuncture as a system. Uh, I mean, you've done, you, when you think back in the last 10 years or more, uh, you've created your own system, you've started teaching it, you know, you've traveled to teach, you've connections in Australia, Europe, here in Ireland, back home in Canada and so on and so forth. So... Uh, um, I mean, obviously, I, I, I believe in the next two, three years, we'll be back on aeroplanes properly and we may have a system of checks and counter checking, but we'll be back to traveling. And uh, uh, so where do you see the progression from this book then to the next book? You know, is that another year long process? Is it? Because it seems to me like the second book is an expansion on the first one. Mm -hmm. So is you going to allow a natural timeline for the first one to sink in before the second one comes out? Or? Well, we are tentatively looking at September 2022 for the publication of the second book. Right. Um, it's going to be with the same publisher. Mm. So... That's that's what the tentative plans are for the moment for the second book. How do you and fit, then how do you fit in all your time to write? So you're, you're teaching, you're still traveling and teaching, albeit within Central Europe. And then you're, you know, uh, working on the second. I'm at my clinic every day, also. Yeah. So your working day must be as long as mine. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, but it's not something I really think about. It's um, when I sit down, I do it. Yeah. You know, the traveling is actually quite useful because that gives me time to write when I'm on the train, when I'm on the plane. Um, you don't have attention deficit disorder like me then. <laughs> um, I can get distracted, but I can also be, I find when I'm traveling, I don't get distracted. 
Okay. It's when I have an hour at home to do nothing. I say I have to sit down and do the book. That's the more difficult time. I get you. Um, and it's also the summer, so it's easier. You know, the clinic is a little bit, lots of people are on holidays. You know, we live in Switzerland where people get four or five weeks holiday a year. So lots of people, you know, the I have more time at the clinic over the summer, which is also why I plan to write it over the summer. Last year was very useful during the lockdown. That's what allowed me to finish the book. Yeah. Do you, do you plan to stay in Switzerland much longer or do you think that's just, you know, you're waiting for your kids to kind of... Um, I'm open to anything. But this is something, you know, people always ask me, do you miss Canada? Or I'm like, we, where I live in Switzerland or where you live in Ireland or anywhere in Europe, or we have a very similar way of life. There might be slight changes, but it's not so much the place that's important. It's the people around you that make, that make your life, your family, your friends. Hmm. So I don't really attach to one place. So if my life brought me outside of Switzerland, it brings me outside of Switzerland. Hmm. All right. Now, as you said, yeah, I have two kids, two teenage kids. So until they've, left home and doing what they're going to do that's not an option but at the same time it's not something that i really think about is switzerland's a very comfortable place it's very nice yeah you know and as an acupuncture it's probably one of the best places to work in, in europe yeah you, you said that to me before that it's you know it's very well integrated i've actually two students just arrived from Switzerland uh, the last couple of days and they're going to come down from Dublin to um, to meet me next Friday. So I'm hoping to catch up and do some Qigong here out in the field, which would be nice to actually, hopefully if it's not raining, <laughs> uh, you know, it'd be nice to, to actually finally do a one sort of two-on-one class out in the open in nature. Mm-hmm. And, um one of those students uh, trained in Twina for a couple of years and then went on and, you know, did Tibetan uh, bowl, you know, these bowl, uh, the singing bowls and different things like that. Yeah. Hypnotherapy and different things. So uh, she, she loves working with the corporate sector, you know, um, and the other chap is already working in the corporate world, but has set up his own uh, private company developing apps for fitness, for, for biohacking. And, mm-hmm. um, and we're hoping to, to do a collaboration. So I'm not going to reveal too much, but it could be pretty exciting. Um, and so hopefully we can march on with that and, and bring some exciting stuff to the, to the online community. Um, in terms of then for yourself, progression from, say, you know, you were learning some five element and a bit of TCM and Japanese stuff and Korean stuff. And then you said, do you exclusively now only use UAT or do you still like to throw in some of the old stuff? Uh, well, what I would say is that the UAT, the Unified Acupuncture Theory System, is my basis. It's because what it's supposed to be. And this is the idea is that it unifies all the other systems, whether it be in Korean, Japanese, five elements, TCM, um, auricular therapy, Jap- you know, it, it's a foundation in which to navigate all the other systems. So in my clinic, I say I do my system, but my system includes, you know, the Korean four needle technique. It includes Japanese uh, channel theory. It includes Master Tong. It includes the Dr. Tam balance system. It includes uh, traditional TCM. It includes the Worsley School of Five Elements. It, it has access to all of those. It's just a springboard and, uh, and a unifying line between them so I can bring them in and go out of them. So that's often what I teach is it's an inclusive system. It's not an exclusive system. It's meant to allow you to accumulate all the different tools you want to use and then have a framework in which to navigate between them. Right. 
Yeah. So in the clinic, if somebody were to watch me, they'd say, oh, you're doing balance system or somebody else would come in the next day and they say, oh, you're, only, you're doing the Sa'am acupuncture. Somebody would say, oh, you, you're using Master Tong. But for me, all of them are based on the, I found a similar framework for all of them. Cool. Now, because this is cup of chi, and yes. it's all about self-nourishment, can you tell the viewers, what is Jonathan Shubb's, uh, you know, what, what things do you do for yourself to help keep you, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually in check? Because I know we all, I mean, I get, I work damn bloody hard and I get exhausted sometimes the following day. So I do spend sometimes a little bit longer sleeping and resting and then mm -hmm. I spend the day relaxing with the kids. And then later on this afternoon, I'll do some workouts, some Qigong. And then some days I'll get up early and do Qigong. Um, what's the kind of thing for you, you know, I mean, music or, you know, reading books or walking in mm -hmm. nature? What sort of stuff do you, are you interested in doing? Well, there's a couple of things that I have that are part of my routine. So, um, Meditation is an important aspect. I meditate every morning and every evening. Um, I, do the, I do Qigong. We've been doing Qigong for the last year and a bit. I do Qigong sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. But on average, about four times a week, I'll do some Qigong. When things are going very well, I'll do it every day. But I think one of the most important things is how I choose what I consume. And consumption is not just about food, even though food and drink are important. Yeah. But I read a lot. Um, and I make, I choose what I allow to come into my realm that I will find that will be nourishing. Hmm. Um, probably one of the best things I've done in the last two years is I took all social media off my phone hmm. wow. and that has amazingly freed up so much of my time. You know, I still have it on my computer and I'll still check Facebook when I'm at the office or, but I don't interact with it on a daily basis. That's um, super interesting. I've, um, in the last podcast there with my, my, my friend there from Greece, Thanos, he was saying, you know, that's the one of the top things he, he's learned is, you know, he gets up in the morning and he doesn't look at his phone, you know. No. Um, and he pretty much will not, I mean, he's only using predominantly social. I mean, like he was a lot on uh, Instagram and that's pretty much died off now for him. And then he's only using Facebook as a tool for business. He's exactly. Not, you know, he stops any personal stuff. And then Alan Kane, who's, you know, you know, from the Chi Life mm -hmm. and that he's one of my Chi Life instructors. And um, he said he's, you know, he's removed. Um, he's stopped using Facebook other than again for business. Uh, exactly. And, and he said the amount of time he has now is unreal. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's like two yeah. hours a day or something back of his life. It's you know, and I, mm -hmm. and I get it because I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a, I'll be honest with you, and people know this, I'm a bit of a social media junkie. Now, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go on, you know, the Snapchat stuff and all these, there's all these new ones. And my son uses Discord, which is for gamers, and there's Twitch and all these new things. You know, I've been a Facebook fan for many years, and I'm, it, it's actually, I'm getting, getting a bit fed up with it, to be honest with you. It's, um, yeah. you know, it's... Well, what I suggest to people is just remove it from your phone. Mm. You don't have to remove it from your life, but just by removing it from your phone and having your phone, because that's where you go to it and you get lost for two hours. Mm -hmm. If it's on, only on your computer and then you sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to look on Facebook, it's a conscious decision. Mm. Mm. Um. Now, the other thing that I've actually incorporated in my life, and this has been new for, and it's something that I think has really changed is about once a month, 
I do something that I call my sacred day, where I turn off all electronics. Mm. Um, I'll start the day with making myself a nice breakfast, doing qigong, meditation. I can only read, I'll only choose activities that will nourish me as a person. Um, I'll sit and do uh, creative imagination, I'll meditate, and I'll spend a whole day like that. I might go for a walk in nature, but it's a day with myself. And that's a really important aspect mm -hmm. of some sort of, yeah, creating sanity and connecting to something beyond just all the, all the distractions we have around us. Yeah. I know some of my friends, if they, if you told them to do that for a day, they would have a panic attack. Oh, at the beginning, it was horrible. At the beginning, I would, I would sit there and I'd be like, what the hell am I doing? I, and every five minutes I'd want to go to my phone and I'd have to put it down. But once you learn to surrender to it, it's an amazing moment. Sure. I, I used one of my teachers, he's passed on, God love him, is was Stevie Boy Russell. Stevie Boy is known as the Barefoot Doctor, and he he wrote written a lot of books and he was what you call a wayward Taoist. You could tell he was, you know, he liked his partying and it he garnered a lot of uh reputations and uh can I say just he was a bit of a rebel in both in relationships and but uh, a sweet guy and he used to write these books where there were like a retreat in a book and he'd get you to do, you know, uh, to follow basically this routine for like the whole weekend. It was actually really difficult to do, you know, to get up mm -hmm. and just not like decide I'm not going to talk to anyone for three days. I'm going to follow a routine which pretty much just focuses in on washing, cleansing, pooing, peeing, and, and then eating and then doing breath work circle walking, meditation, sacred healing sounds for three days straight. And like literally like as you're cutting or preparing your food, it's just like breath work, just breathing and cutting the carrots or whatever it is you were doing. Uh, and I can imagine for people, and this was pre-social media, so you can imagine for anyone who's like reaching for this, trying to do three days of sacred, imagine three sacred days in a row. That's uh, a lot. I, that's, you know, yeah. I would suggest people start with half a day. Start with your Sunday afternoon, right? Mm. Three hours. You know, mm. five hours. Build up slowly. There's no reason that you have, you know, there are going to be times when you're going to be conf conflicted with it. Yeah. But it's the same thing when I'm teaching meditation to somebody. I say, just meditate for five minutes in the morning. We'll start with that. It doesn't have to be these half an hour, hour sessions. If you can properly, if you can really just sit there with your breath for five minutes a day, you're already starting something. You know, you don't have to jump in at the, at the deep end and, and sink or swim. Mm. Mm. You, you can go in slowly and you know there's there's many ways to do it slowly if you don't feel comfortable turning off taking the facebook off your phone there are applications you can put on your phone that will limit the amount of time you spend on facebook in a day yeah it's like the app will block after an hour i think the big thing about these apps is the push notifications you can switch those off you know like you get like a exactly little, you get this little round circle or dot that appears in the corner of some of the apps and that's telling you you know you've got a message ready or there's something yeah. active on your account and you can actually i think believe disable that so you can do that and because for me i know if i look at my phone and i have a badge i have to open it because i hate seeing the badges <laughs> yeah so yeah. i've turned off the badges on everything that isn't really important yeah can you, you imagine know, if every single person in the world just stopped using Facebook? Can you imagine? Well, here's the thing is that Facebook at the same time, it does have lots of positive aspects to it. It's not in itself 
you know, well, I, yeah, I get you. But can you imagine what? Like, for example, we met through Facebook. If there wasn't Facebook, we would never have met. Look, I, you know, I totally get it. One of my students was the the guy that was responsible for the satellite that circles the planet. That was the first satellite that would help Facebook. And I said to him, how do you feel about it? And he's like, I feel, he said, fucking awful. And I said, why? He said, because, you know, he said, I'm sitting on a bus, a Greyhound bus going across the States, or I'm on a train somewhere. And all I can see is everybody with their heads down doing this. Mm -hmm. And they should be talking to one another and interacting. And I said, yeah, I get you. But I said, you wouldn't be here in Ireland learning acupuncture if it wasn't for that satellite. So exactly. It's, up, you know, you know, I think there's a, there's two things that yes, Facebook's algorithms and the way that they're constructed is there to hold our attention and to make us as um, dependent on it as possible. So there is a problem with the structure of Facebook, mm. but the function of Facebook has some wonderful things to it. Um, Twitter also, you know, the Arab Spring was associated with Twitter. Without Twitter, a lot of analysts think it would never have happened. Mm. So I think it's like with everything. It's how we choose to use it on an individual level. Yeah. I mean, I, I over, over lockdown and first lockdown, I did like a four month Qigong, Qigong with Anthony Monteith group. And mm -hmm. I, I, expect, I asked for 20 people and I got like 150. I got, it was amazing, you know? So yeah, there is, for me, that was great for me. It kept me busy. It stopped my mental health from suffering. Cause you know, I'm definitely addicted to work and but then on the other side of it, when we were running some of the groups, I did, I did some uh, what we call Chi Life 101 training, instructor training back 2017, 18, 19. And I used Facebook as a forum and you can set up modules. So, you know, if you don't have any money, if you don't have the investment to, to use, like I use Coursecraft now, you know, there's all these other mm -hmm. uh things uh, out there that you can use to set up your, your courses and um, but facebook has actually has the same thing you know just the only re, re, uh, the only aspect of it is it requires you to be a member of facebook and of course some of the students don't want to be on facebook anymore mm -hmm. so i get it so that's partly why i went to another platform is that there's less demands on being on social media um, but it was super useful you know, I'm not I'm definitely not against it. And you can see now we've got this, is it clubhouse? I don't get clubhouse. There were so many people raving about clubhouse and I, I tried, I looked and I was like, what is, you know, it's a lot of noise. It's just like a lot of noise for me. It's like, uh, everybody talking over one another and yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. sorry. No. Um, it's, not them, it's like the same it's the same with everything is everything. It depends on how you choose to use it. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing with literature. You can read a book and you can actually get into the book or you can take it as a literal truth. And then you end up creating a whole bunch of other problems. Everything is about a personal choice as to how you interact with it. Sure. My son got his first mobile phone. Now he's just turned 13 and uh, he's, the strict rules is no social media on his phone whatsoever. And he made a mistake yesterday of downloading TikTok and he knew straight <laughs> away he was going to get in trouble. And he, he removed it, you know, immediately, but he was downloading it to check on what I was doing. <laughs> and, I, and I feel this awful sense of like, I'm setting a really bad example because we're allowed to mm -hmm. do it. I've got Facebook, I've got TikTok and uh, you know, it, originally my plan was to do TikTok just to keep some fun memories of me and the kids. And then it ended up, I thought, wouldn't it be good to do Qigong on TikTok? Because there was, there was very few people doing any Qigong or lots of martial arts on there and punching and kicking and fighting. So I started doing that. And then I just don't know, I just lost momentum with it. And then, you know, you hear some bad things about TikTok and what it's really about. And then you kind of go, oh, you know. Uh, 
But I have to, I don't know if you've experienced this, or maybe you could tell me. Or, so last night, like I had a big day yesterday. I didn't get home. For a Saturday, it was a long day. I probably didn't get home to about half eight in the evening. And I literally just picked up my phone like that and just threw it in my bag and, and before I got out of the car. And I thought, I'm just not looking at my phone. I'm exhausted. And I thought, why do I feel like that? Because I haven't actually used my phone all day, but it was the, it was the constant chat to people all day yesterday and some pretty heavy problems. And I thought, you know, I just don't need to talk to anyone else. And it's funny, you know, I had a nice meal. We chat with friends, a couple of glasses of wine. And then I checked my phone and it's like, oh, message from Jonathan, message from George, message from my mom, message from my friends in other countries. You just, you know, you think I'm going to give up the phone, but you still go and check it for messages. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a strange one, you know, um, there's nothing weirder than being in an airport and you're sat on the loo doing a number two and you know, the guy in the store next year is on, <laughs> you know, he's checking Tinder or he's checking Facebook or, and it's like, that's the way life has gone, isn't it? It's just bloody odd, you know? Yeah. No, it's clear. Um, if we think about it, the phone can be, a, it's an amazing piece of technology is I can write you a message in Switzerland and you're going to get it in Ireland yeah. and you're going to respond to me and we're going to have, be able to hold on to, to communication. It's the yeah. same thing with us being able to talk here. Yeah. But I think it's also, we have to consciously decide how we're going to use it um yeah but you can't beat this. how how do you want to interact with it you can't beat this in my book like literally i i've actually dumped thousands of books i had a big library and then when i was doing a clear out i just got rid of them to charity and now i've just gone the other way now i just started buying loads of books again and it's mm -hmm. what is it about a book that gets you away from social media well i think so I normally read around two books a week. That's about how much I read. That's great. Um, what I would say is, is, is that the book has the ability for you to interact with your own imagery in your own mind. Yeah. Now, when you look at a phone, you're absorbing somebody else's image, and then you're going to translate it into how you interact with it but you're still absorbing somebody else's image. When you read a book, you have to create the image yourself. And I'll be reading and all of a sudden I'll find myself in a moment of reverie about, uh, about something completely different. And then I'll engage it and I'll feel it and it makes us feel more alive. Whereas... And, you know, there are some things with images that do the same thing. This is why I like to watch old movies or movies, even re recent movies, but that don't have many special effects. Mm. Mm. Um, as soon as you start having the special effects, you start going into feeling the other image as opposed to interacting with what's inside of you. That's and funny because I really love, I mean, I don't like the Marvel stuff. My kids love it, you know. But I like mm -hmm. Star Wars, you know, and I'm talking those crappy ones made in the year 2000 with, you know, Darth Maul. I'm talking like the old school, like even as a kid, you, you kind of, you, you kind of knew it was special effects, you know, the, the lightsaber, you could kind of seal the real sword behind the lightsaber, but part of your brain went, yeah, ignore it. It's a real lightsaber. You know, you wanted yeah. to believe well, that's the thing is, and then you created a true story in yourself based on that. Mm. So this is why one of my favorite types of movies are Westerns, because there's absolutely no special effects. What's your favorite Western? I think it has to be The Magnificent Seven. Right. That's a samurai tale. It was originally, and the samurai tale is, the, the Seven Samurai is also a wonderful movie. Mm. Um, you know, those, what I like about it is, is that there's no, it's almost like reading a book. You have an image that doesn't move for a minute and all you see is somebody's facial expression. 
Mm. And what is he thinking? What is he doing? How does that make me feel? What's happening to me? Those types of interactions, right? You know, um, and then like even the old James Bond movies where it was so unrealistic that you were able to go into the imaginary with it. And then you have these new ones with all these special effects and, yeah, you know. It's funny when you talk about James Bond, I think about Moonraker and they think like, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> like, you know. They must have been drinking uh, way too much in that boardroom when they were coming up with that one. Yeah. Uh, or like you go and you watch the original Superman movie. If you want to watch, if you if kids, they go into the newsroom and they're all still there on typewriters because computers hadn't inv- yeah. gotten into the world yet. And I remember showing it to my kids and they're like, what the hell are those machines? Yeah. I actually had a bit of a tantrum with my son over Superman one because he was going on about, he was he, he's a snob when it comes to special effects. If a film's any older than 2012, he's like, oh, oh. And he, he makes this sarcastic, oh, legendary graphics, you know. This is kind of like saying, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if it's it's got to be the latest for him and latest and the greatest. And so I made him watch Superman 1, of course. And um, the original one is like three hours long. I didn't realize yeah. how bloody hell. Like, so, I mean, that's, that's something, you know, three hours back then was, was, you know, in those old seats in the cinema, that was, you know, a non-bomb. And then... Um, <laughs> You know, of course, it got to the scene where he throws the crystal, the kryptonite, or whatever it is, into the into the ice flow, and then the the ice house comes up, and you could obviously tell the ice was like plastic or fiberglass, and then he started just going in this massive tirade of abuse about the special effects, not real, and even though I was trying to explain to him, you know, this film was probably filmed in like seventy seven, seventy eight, and released in seventy nine, mm-hmm. like it's an old film. Oh no, not good enough. So I just switched it off, and I, and I said, "Right, leave the room. If you're going to insult something that Daddy is enjoying, you know." And it's, it, I, I'm thinking, Jesus, the expectation from kids now, um, well, their imagination. How I don't. I've gotten my kids to watch old movies, hmm. um, and for example, The Great Escape was, I think, the first one I got them to watch. That's a legendary film. That's that's in my top 10. And the thing was, is the older one, I think he was maybe 10 or nine when I first showed it to them. He's like, it's amazing. It was for three hours. Almost nothing happened. But I was engaged the whole time. And so that's why I suggest going, moving away from movies that have any special effects in it. Hmm. For them to actually see, okay, there's a story. I have to get involved with the characters and not just the images. Hmm. Um, another great one for that is The Sting. Yeah, The Sting is fantastic, isn't it? You so know, I grew up with um, those films, you know. That's the kind of films my parents would have watched. Have you ever seen a film called... Um, the, oh, what is it? Street, Fight, Street Fighter. It's with Charles Branson. I don't think I have, no. no I'll go and check it out, get... You know, it's, um, I mean, I remember watching it with my mom and thinking my mom is the most prudish person and quite conservative and, you know, you can't even swear in front of her. Uh, and yet she, she saw this film years ago when they were, li- I think they were living in South Africa or somewhere like that. And they watched this film and she loved it. And it was, it's the grit, it's the grit and the determination. And it's, a, it's actually mm-hmm. a film where Bronson is, you know, not stereotyped into this, you know, death wish character. He's, he's literally just this kind of, he's, he's built for one thing is to fight on the street, to fight for survival and fight for money. And I think it's like set in the twenties or the thirties America. It's, you know, um, and it's, it's a, it's not a very well-known film, but it's fantastic. It's really, okay, I'll take a look at it. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, but you're right. I think I'm wondering. Then does that mean my son has a lack of imagination, or he's reliant well, on that stimulation? I think it's very difficult for child for children now to engage with their imagination. We've made it more difficult for them. Mm. 
I remember when my older son, I think he was seven, I was sitting on the couch with him and he started to cry. I said, what's wrong? He says, I'm really worried that the school is, when I go to school, they're going to steal my imagination from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And that I think is a real fear of not just school, but our movies, everything. It's more difficult for us to engage in imagination when I'm sure your son was the same way when he was five or six, you give him two, give him a block and a ball and he'll come up with some sort of game and a story and he'll spend hours just. Yeah. They still do. Like we just got a pet cat for my daughter's birthday and she'd been pestering us for years to get one. And they, you know, we went out and we bought hundreds of euros of equipment and play pens and blah, blah, blah. And then, I had a box of couch roll for the clinic. My son took it, took it upstairs, a pair of scissors, some tape, and they built uh, a mini uh, fortress for the cat to hide in from the dog. And they were up there for hours building it, designing it, ladders, little peepholes. Exactly. And it's like, and I did not disturb them. I didn't go up there and say, you know, I've stopped making it no. or trying to control it. I was like, let them, let them do it, let them play it out and let them work. Yeah work with design and because at the end of the day, I mean, we've, I've two boxes in the man cave there, big, huge boxes from moving and they cut those out and turned them into mini bumper cars, you know, and this is a 13 year old and a nine year old. They're still got that crafting, uh, skill. Yeah. 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 They're so still addicted to screens. You know, we have to, I, we give them that we temper their, their, um, screen time we give them you know an hour morning an hour mm-hmm. evening that's it and it's not guaranteed you know so it's not a guarantee that you're going to get it every day um uh, and the, the huff and the puff when they don't get it for misbehavior it's it's like i mean no the world doesn't collapse around them you know some kids have a massive tantrum if they, but i think those kids generally they may be overly addicted to the screen um but I, I am blessed, you know, I'm absolutely blessed. I'm not the best reader. For me to read two books a week would be epic. I'd love to know, <laughs> I'd love to know what discipline. I know, you know, possibly I could just do or, or I have the time. It's not like I don't have the time, right? I'm two and a half hours commuting every day. I could just put on audio books. I could just yeah. listen. Why not, right? Um, it's a question of... Um, what I would suggest is don't read books, you know, have some technical books that you read for Qigong or for acupuncture or whatever, and then have books that are pure joy that are about getting involved in a story. Yeah. I used to love HG Wells and a lot of people criticize me for that. They said, oh, it's a bit stodgy, a bit, you know. Uh, old school well, but I used and to it is it. and but it touched something in you it created some sort of image in you that you oh yeah that you responded to it, it terrified me as well it's straight it was strangely terrified me and then you know we're talking about these these uh labs in china that are merging you know humans with pig dna and you know, mice <laughs> with human DNA. And I'm thinking of the island of Dr. Moreau and I'm going, oh yeah, I remember in that, you know. Uh, and it's like the guy was really tuning into some concepts mm-hmm. that can still be, you know, talked about today. And, um, you know, it was the only book where, you know, I'd sit down and then seriously read it, like really concentrate. And then, I think they made a musical and I used to listen to the musical War of the Worlds. And I think the Richard Burton doing the narrative was just chilling. It was so phenomenal. And uh, I stopped reading novels after that. I think I read maybe one, The Born Identity, I think it was. I read that about 30 years ago um, and completely different to any of the films, of course. I think it was a really, mm-hmm. bad, it was a really bad version of it with Richard Chamberlain. Um, but it, you know, and, oh, the day of the, the day of the jackal, 
um, Frederick Forsyth. I really love that book. Um, um, but yeah, I haven't read well, any real Ruth, fantasy novels. Well, that's the thing is when I was young, when I was, I think, 13 or 14, I would read I've, everything was fantasy for me. Okay. And Chinese philosophy. I started reading Chinese philosophy when I was 13, I think, or 14. Hmm. But in the last couple of months, I've gone back to traditional literature. I've started reading Herman Hess and Somerset Maugham and right. Dickens and Orwell. and Right, right. Yeah. My wife's an English graduate. Like she's, um, you know, she reads like pro prolifically, like, uh, and she's yeah. dead disciplined. Even if she doesn't enjoy the book, it's like this book is awful. She will see it through to the end out of respect for the author, you know. Yeah, it's I, I appreciate that suffer. very much. Yeah, she'll yeah. suffer it. But if there's one book I would suggest that you read right now, I would suggest you, if you haven't read it, it's Steppenwolf by Herman Hess. Steppenwolf sounds like a great band. <laughs> It was a great band, but it was named after the book. Okay. Step and um, What's it about briefly without giving it away too much? So it's about a man who feels caught between two parts of himself. One is he's, a, he's like a lone wolf from the steppes, which are the plains in Germany. And the other is a human being. And how he interacts and understands both those parts of himself sounds like me <laughs> that's why i was suggesting it for you um constantly wrestling with myself you know and then you have this is how you'll know that it's for you is there's something in it called the magic theater and the magic theater only for mad people pay with your mind Mm. interesting so yeah that was a recent book that i reread that i thought actually thought of you when i was reading it that you would you would quite enjoy it okay i'm gonna check it out i know my wife the last book i got gifted well i got a few books of martial arts from a friend but um was um zen and the art of motorcycles um yes that's and, an excellent book and my wife gifted me that for my birthday last year and it's still in the cupboard i haven't read it yet but um yeah i have a pile of books by the side of my bed it's hilarious like you just laugh it's like mm -hmm. uh qigong this qigong that way of qigong art of qigong, da -da -da qigong, da -da qigong and it's just like my wife's looking at me going you need to read a novel and use your imagination yeah. you need to exactly. use your imagination so yeah definitely it's coming back which coming back to my book is one of the reasons why I wrote it in this way is that it does have that aspect of a novel hmm. Hmm. where you can release your imagination and acquire information at the same time. What's the most fantastic book? I know there's more probably in the pipeline to read, but mm -hmm. which one, I'm not even going to say fantastic, which one has made the biggest impact for you? So I'm going to have to put them into different categories. From a philosophy book, mm. I'm going to say it's the Chuangzu, which is one of the main three Taoist texts. That was a very big book. Um, the book that got me interested in reading, that got me sucked into the idea of reading, was Lord of the Rings when I was 12. And then... The book that probably had the biggest influence, huh? There's Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, which had a huge influence. Okay. Um, and also The Razor's Edge by Somerset Maugham. It's interesting that the book that made the biggest impact for me didn't was was nothing really contemporary or classical or you know considered a literary work of genius and it was in that moment when after I injured my knee quite badly that I was in this kind of even though I'd recovered like making a recovery I was in this like 
um, I, I'd, I'd placed all my emotional anger, hurt and blame and disappointment and also used martial arts as a therapy to channel my rage, my inner rage. And then it was all taken away from me. And the buddy that I worked with at the time, he was Kung Fu and Tai Chi and Wing Chun and, and a yoga dude. And he's still, still buddies. Um, he just gave me this book and he said, uh, no ordinary moments, you know, and it was Dan Millman. And I read that book mm -hmm. and I didn't get it. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> like, you know, and it, and it took me a while to realize what was going on. It's, it's, um, and it actually then that book was the stepping stone to go back in time to his first book where the peaceful warrior. And when I, and I actually yeah. couldn't, couldn't get that book. It was out for some reason I couldn't get it. So I went to the library and it was in the library. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, I read it and I read it again and I read it about three times and it was only a little thin book and when nobody more, yeah. it's quite a big one. And I bloody loved it. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to write a, write a book like that. And it just, it was that, I, the idea of that, you know, injury, transformation, healing, Yeah. that, that the injury, well, injury changed, changed the boy, changed mm -hmm. the man to a man or whatever. It's actually very funny you mention that because the book I'm reading at the moment is another Dan Millman book. It's uh, the journey of Socrates. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. It's the yeah. prequel that he wrote many years after to the way of the peaceful warrior. Yeah. I haven't read any of his, I mean, I've read some of the ones around numerology and that, but I haven't, I haven't gone back and read any of his books, his other ones, but yeah, I mm -hmm. just, yeah, I really, it was just like, who the hell is Socrates? You know, why did he call him Socrates? That's, that's what this book that I'm reading right now is about. It's the journeys of Socrates. It's about who Socrates was before Dan Millman met him. It's funny because in the film, they missed out some big, there's a big part in there at the end where there's this like death of the self and that's left out of the film, you know? Um, and, you know, you have, uh, is who plays um, Socrates? Is it Nick Nolte? Not Nick Nolte. Is it Nick Nolte? I don't think I've ever seen the film. I've only read the books. Yeah. I think the guy, I think it's Nick Nolte plays and he does a good job. I mean, he's, uh, a great actor, really great actor, but it's not how I imagine Socrates to be, you know? <laughs> that's, see, that's the difference between reading and watching the movies. When you read it, you create the image yourself. Cool. When you watch the movie, you're forced to see somebody else's interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're coming up on the hour. We're just over the hour now. So is there anything else? Is there any... Bits of advice for self-nourishment. I know you've talked about meditation, being out in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, obviously for me, sleep is a big one. I know sleep's been an issue for both of us this last year. Um, but it's it's like, uh, what, and, and obviously then how you nourish yourself is the takeaway that I'm getting from this. I think for me that's, yeah. If you anything else is you want to, to say, focus on what you, sorry, go ahead. So anything else you want to say? I know you were going to say something that I interrupted you. Well, I was going to focus on choose what you consume, whether it's food, whether it's media, whether it's literature, whether it's people, choose how you interact, make a conscious decision that this is, these are the choices I'm going to make. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, this is nourishing for my soul or this isn't. If it's not nourishing for my soul, I don't need it. I can still enjoy it, but I consciously know I'm not doing this for that. And when, the more you do that, I think the more you start to choose things that are really for you. Mm -hmm. And that helps make all the other choices easier. One of the things I noticed, this is in the clinic when I work with people and lots of other therapists or counselors are saying, do this, do that, um, eat these foods, you make sure you sleep eight hours a night, all of this stuff. But if you're not consciously choosing them, you're going to feel in conflict with yourself. 
It's going to be a battle as it's supposed to you nourishing yourself. So that's where I think the frame, the frame of mind is very important. You know, it's if to go into the Buddhist theories, you know, you have the eight, the eightfold wheel, upright thought, upright meditation, upright speech, upright consumption. And for me, it's all about making a choice of what's better, what, what do you think is best for you? Yeah. I mean, people have been wondering why I'm sitting on the floor with this couch behind me podcasting this way, but I've been practicing ground living and uh, it's hilarious. The as soon as I started to work on sitting on the floor in different postures, squatting, walking more barefoot, I've got barefoot shoes, just something I'm trying, experimenting with after being inspired by somebody else's work, bloody $3,000 couches arrive <laughs> to challenge me. And they're very comfy. But I know that if I spend some most of my day trying to nourish that feeling of being comfortable being on the floor without getting numb, and you know yourself from meditation. I mean, I have a lot of friends who meditate and they have to meditate on a stool or they have to have a meditation chair or they have to have a, mm -hmm. something with a, a back support. And, and, and really when I'm thinking of it, I used to do martial arts, so sitting on the floor should be a natural thing it should be a natural thing that we would have done. Not saying it's the most comfortable thing. Um, then these beautiful couches arrived, as you can see. So, um, but then I know that later on tonight, if I want, if I choose, I can mm -hmm. watch, an, I can watch the Magnificent Seven on the couch. Exactly. You know? Um, and I think that's the big takeaway is, is choose how you nourish yourself, choose what you want to nourish yourself with. And that doesn't mean 27 gin and tonics, but it's, it's, it can, it can. <laughs> if you consciously make that decision that you want to drink a nice whiskey or a gin and tonic. Yeah, no, of course, of course. I mean, we were talking about it in the last podcast with Thanos was, um, you know, his teacher would say, you know, uh, does that food resonate with you when you when you're shopping or choosing your food? Does it feel mm -hmm. right for you? And I, I was laughing because I was telling him I, I tried the exercise and I came back with a packet of wild rice grapes and some honey. That's all I was allowed. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing at me, you know. But yeah, that's what what for whatever reason resonated with me and what I needed to eat. Um, yeah, combination, but it worked. But sometimes that can be a bit difficult because people aren't in tune with themselves. You've done lots of work on yourself. We've yeah. done the meditations, all that. Often what I tell people is, is when you stand in front of something, see if your body opens or closes to it. Mm. Mm. Do you feel more open as you get it or do you feel resistance? Yeah. Are you drawn to it or does it repel you? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I've eaten some strange foods, definitely. I mean, I can tell you now, I mean, I've eaten some strange creatures and they weren't that bad. You know, the thought of eating them was more, more terrifying than the taste. That's also very cultural. That's very much how we project human emotions onto different animals. The only thing and I have... the mythologies we have behind the animals. Yeah. The only thing I haven't eaten is the egg, you know, the egg that's buried. And I refuse, okay. to, I refuse to eat dog. I don't know why. I mean, obviously it's a, it's a pet and all that, but it's, you know, there's this art that, you know, well, you, you don't eat a dog, but you'll eat a cow, you know, mm -hmm. that's the difference. But yeah, I don't know. I just draw the line. Um, How about bats? Will you eat bats? I'd eat a bat. Yeah. I'd give a bat a go. I mean, obviously if it's a protected... <laughs> Uh, if it's a protected <laughs> species, uh, I wouldn't eat it. But yeah, I give it a go. I mean, it's a mammal, right? So you know, mm -hmm. it's like a rodent or whatever. And uh, they say rat is very tasty. Um, well, so that was the original ratatouille. <laughs> hey, don't laugh. We watched that cartoon the other day, and I was expecting to be bitterly disappointed, but we had great fun uh yeah. watching that we it's, it's one of my wife's favorite animations ratatouille is so ridiculous but 
Um, <laughs> good. So there we go. Another episode done. Uh, thanks very much for your time, Jonathan, on a on a Sunday. And um, my pleasure. Again, so a little quick plug again. Sun seasons of channels. I know it's in reverse here on the thing. Uh, coming out on the twenty first. Uh, it's it's really an introduction to the philosophy of Chinese medical. Uh, you know the idea of the channels uh, related to, particularly to the construction of the energetics of the human. So not just there for students or graduates, but also for lay people. Uh, great illustrations by an Irish uh, artist uh, who's done work for other other people. Um, I'm privileged to get a, a pre-copy, um, and I even would I have recommended to all my students as well. So let's see how we go. Let's see what adventures it brings for you. I'm looking forward to seeing the progress. It might get to the point where I can't even get you on the bloody podcast because it's you become so famous. But I'll always make time for you. <laughs> well, we'll hope that I'm looking forward to receiving you here in Ireland. Uh, we're looking what at November, hopefully, and um, yeah, that's and, when we've planned it so far. Yeah, so we're waiting on government announcements in the next few days on on you know indoor mm -hmm. indoor uh, activities. So, on that note, thanks very much, everyone, and uh, thanks to Jonathan. And if Thank you want you. any, if you want to get the book or order it, I'll leave a link below. And here comes my daughter with a kitty cat. Uh, it was always good. If, you know, if you're not going to win on a podcast, bring in a cute cat. That always, you know, that seems to work, doesn't it? Cute kitten. It does. Cute kittens. <laughs> Kitty's wrapped in cotton. It's a cow. So, cheers. Thank you. I